There are times when the most basic activity our body performs, namely breathing, can become very difficult. Breathing difficulty can be frightening, but don't panic. This phenomenon, called dyspnea, can be caused by various factors that are not necessarily serious. Let's find out about them together with today's video. Hello everyone and welcome to Med4Care. Let's start by looking at what exactly dyspnea is. The first thing to consider is the definition of this feeling. Since it is something subjective, it is not so easy to describe it, which is why there are several definitions. They range from the subjective sensation of breathing with difficulty, to subjective experience of respiratory discomfort characterized by distinct sensations that vary in intensity. As it can therefore vary from individual to individual, dyspnea is a symptom that is difficult to describe objectively, but is in any case linked to an actual impediment encountered during breathing. Dyspnea may be present during the entire respiratory act, only in the first phase, the inspiratory phase, when air is drawn into the lungs, or only in the last phase, when air is expelled, for example on exhalation. Shortness of breath is a symptom that manifests itself more frequently in the later stages of life, because it affects elderly patients more, who have problems with their respiratory system or heart. In any case, dyspnea constitutes a potential danger for the patient in the short term and must be treated in a timely manner so that the underlying pathology does not develop seriously. Dyspnea may depend on primary diseases of the respiratory tree, bronchi or lungs, it may be caused by chronic heart failure, or by changes in the central nervous system. Dyspnea is always to be considered as a symptom of a disease rather than a disease in its own right. By virtue of this, dyspnea can depend on categories, namely disease secondary to respiratory disease, cardiac, neuromuscular, general causes, or psychogenic. Let's look at them one by one. Many respiratory diseases, such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia or pneumothorax can easily lead to subjective breathing difficulties and thus to dyspnea. The other major player in breathing difficulties can be the heart. In fact, it can happen that the heart has difficulty pumping blood, as happens in heart failure, due to chronic diseases or acute heart pump problems. In this situation, the blood in the circulatory stream is not easily pushed away by the malfunctioning heart pump and tends to accumulate in the declivity of the body or in the lungs, depending on whether the heart problem is greater in the left or right heart, respectively. The accumulation of fluid in the chest is ultimately responsible for the sensation of dyspnea. Other diseases that lead to breathing difficulties affect the whole body and are anemia, thyrotoxicosis or acute renal failure, these can lead to a deficit in oxygen transport to the tissues and, consequently, lead to a feeling of air hunger, which pushes the patient to take in as much air as possible. Diseases of the central nervous system and neuromuscular diseases can also impair regular respiratory function. So far we have seen causes of an organic nature, example, due to an illness of the body. However, there are other conditions, this time of a psychological nature, that can induce breathing difficulty. For example, in hyperventilation syndrome or psychogenic dyspnea, the patient experiences a subjective feeling of difficulty during breathing, which often resolves spontaneously within a short time. Underlying dyspnea is always an alteration in the physiological balance that governs the respiratory acts themselves. When the information coming into the central nervous system is altered, such as following a pathology, the respiratory nerve center orchestrates a response for the muscular system of respiration, which causes the patient to perceive breathing as labored and difficult. Let us now analyze the causes of dyspnea no longer according to the type of apparatus involved, but according to the duration of presentation. For example, it can be 
acute when it presents for the duration of hours or a few days, as in the case of pulmonary thromboembolism. Subacute, if it lasts up to a few weeks, as in the case of bacterial or fungal pneumonia. Chronic if it lasts for months or even years, as in the case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Finally, a further way of classifying dyspnea is according to the mode of presentation during breathing. Dyspnea thus can be defined as inspiratory, expiratory, or mixed. First of all, it is necessary to determine the level of difficulty in breathing, especially according to the activities the patient is able to perform. The greater the amount of activity the subject is able to perform, the lower the degree of dyspnea will be. This assessment can also be done by the patient himself, using simple self-anamnesis tests, through which the severity of the current dyspnea can be understood and communicated to the doctor in a timely manner. This can be done using the modified Borg scale, which asks the patient to quantify the perceived sensation of shortness of breath. The scale starts from a minimum value of 0 where there is no negative sensation felt during breathing, up to a value of 10 where the worst possible shortness of breath is felt. The other scale used to assess dyspnea is based on four classes, determined from a questionnaire drawn up by the New York Heart Association. Class 1 Dyspnea There is no particular limitation and habitual physical activity is carried out as usual. Class 2 Dyspnea There is well-being at rest but habitual physical activity begins to produce slight limitations, such as fatigue and palpitations. Class 3, there is well-being at rest, but habitual physical activity produces severe limitations. Class 4, dyspnea, there are symptoms of discomfort even in the most basic activities. The initial assessment of the patient with dyspnea should preferably be carried out in a pulmonology department, where the patient can perform various breathing tests in sequence. The pulmonologist, after gathering information on the patient, on the possible presence of hereditary diseases in the family and on the medication currently being taken, asks the patient to describe the intensity of the dyspnea reported and whether he or she has noticed any other symptoms present at the same time as the breathing difficulty. For example, the presence of a constant cough and a strong smoking habit may orient the doctor towards a diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Conversely, sensations of punctal chest pain may point towards a diagnosis of problems with the heart, pericarditis, pleura, pneumothorax, or lungs, pneumonia. If, on the other hand, dyspnea is associated with symptoms such as dysphagia and retrosternal heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease can be hypothesis. Dyspnea in this case may be due to the aspiration into the lungs of a small amount of gastric content, which thus irritates the lung tissue. The next step in the examination of the patient with dyspnea is the physical examination, or objective examination. The doctor assesses the severity of the dyspnea through various elements. The respiratory effort produced. The use of the accessory breathing muscles. The greater the respiratory effort and the use of accessory respiratory muscles, the greater the severity of dyspnea. The presence of neck vein distension at the medical examination may point towards a diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or congestive heart failure. The final stages of the examination involve palpation of the chest and the request to utter, if possible, the famous phrase 33 or rhubarb in the meantime, which allows us to verify how the vibration is transmitted inside the chest to the skin. This procedure is called tactile vocal tremor assessment. Finally, auscultation of the chest is performed to reveal abnormal noises, such as signs of strider or altered breathing sounds that may suggest chest pathologies. Tests for the evaluation of dyspnea are prescribed once the anamnesis and objective examination phases have been completed. In fact, the definitive diagnosis of the origin of dyspnea relies on instrumental and laboratory tests. As an immediate first assessment, we use the saturimeter which measures dyspnea indirectly. It tells us how much oxygen is present in the body and thus how much the respiratory system is in distress. For greater precision, the saturation meter measures the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin by simply placing the sensor on the patient's finger. It is a useful evaluation in an emergency because it gives rapid and reproducible information that immediately guides one as to the severity of the case in question. There are also more refined instruments to obtain more precise information. 
Hemogas analysis is a laboratory test that is performed from an arterial or venous blood sample and provides more reliable information on gas exchange, ventilation, and acid-base balance, allowing a possible diagnosis of the origin of dyspnea. It can in fact identify the condition of excess acids or bases in the blood and whether the problem is predominantly respiratory or metabolic. By cross-referencing this information, hemogas analysis is able to divide the patient's situation into four different options. Metabolic acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. Metabolic alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis. In this way, Himoga's analysis narrows the field of investigation by suggesting possible causes for each of these conditions. Other laboratory tests useful in characterizing difficulty in breathing consist of blood tests that assess the blood count, example, the amount of cells in the blood, in order to be able to detect any reduction in red blood cells, anemia. The renal function panel, in order to be able to attest to an ongoing renal insufficiency, which tends to lead to a buildup of fluid and thus to dyspnea from lung imbibition. The D-dimer, which assesses clotting capacity, useful in evaluating episodes of pulmonary thromboembolism. Cardiac enzymes, such as troponins or BNP peptide, which investigate the state of cardiac distress, secondary to decompensation or infarction. Now let's see which instrumental examinations are most commonly used to best define breathing difficulty. Direct chest x-ray is useful for getting a quick idea of the situation inside the chest and detecting, for example, states of diffuse or partial lung infiltration or pneumothorax. The electrocardiogram is another very rapid examination that allows the cardiac implications of dyspnea to be assessed. Chest ultrasound, which is quick to perform and often performed in an emergency slash urgency, is good for assessing the amount of fluid present in the lungs or pleura as well as the presence of air in the pleura, pneumothorax. A CT scan of the thorax is the main examination for viewing the entire thorax in greater detail than other instrumental examinations and therefore makes it possible to rule out most pulmonary and intrathoracic diseases in general, such as intrathoracic masses due to diseases that replace normal lung tissue, pneumonia or neoplasms. These that we have seen so far are the examinations that are conducted immediately and acutely in all patients with dyspnea. Then there are additional examinations that take longer to conduct but are particularly informative. These include spirometry, which is used to quantify the various lung volumes both at a static level, for example the amount of air that physically enters the lung, and at a dynamic level, like the amount of air that can enter or leave the lung in a given time. By assessing these parameters, it is possible to make a diagnosis of obstructive or restrictive lung disease, for example a lung that struggles to let air in or out over time or a lung that has a low air capacity inside, respectively. Each of the two conditions has a number of diseases that can induce it, such as pneumonia for restrictive disease or asthma and chronic bronchitis for obstructive. Acute dyspnea can develop into even fatal situations for the patient and for this reason must require rapid intervention, during which the patient must be constantly monitored in his or her vital parameters and oxygen saturation. When dyspnea is a prelude to impending respiratory failure, oxygen therapy must always be administered to the patient, especially when saturation becomes less than 94%. Oxygen therapy must, however, be carried out in the most appropriate manner, as it can produce toxicity effects due to the damage triggered by oxygen-free radicals if carried out for a long time. For this purpose, oxygen therapy can be delivered by means of a nasal cannula, by a simple mask, or by the reservoir mask. Along with oxygen therapy, the administration of anxiolytic and relaxing drugs for the patient, such as morphine and benzodiazepines either orally or parenterally, should be considered. Dyspnea is a disabling respiratory symptom for the patient, as one of the most important vital functions, namely breathing, is impaired. Dyspnea may evolve into more serious clinical situations or, on the contrary, may resolve on its own depending on the pathology from which it originates, and therefore the therapy to be set up becomes purely etiological. We are now at the end of today's video, we hope you enjoyed it. If you found it useful, please support us with a nice like, subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to be notified each time a new Med4Care video comes out. See you soon on Med4Care.